you are now experiencing the, 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 the Digital Life with Kevin Lockett. Hey everybody, welcome to the Digital Life. On today's show, I discuss crowdsourcing and community projects with Pete Nish, Executive Director of the Summit County Democratic Party. Now, Pete is also part of DAP Emerging Leaders, where they raised over $14,000 on Kickstarter to paint a colorful mural by the local bus station. During our conversation, we also discussed the future of public education, his love for Akron, and the effect his wife has had on his life. It's very touching. It's very nice. So without further ado, here's my conversation with Pete Nish. Okay, we're talking to Pete Nish, Executive Director of the Summit County Democratic Party. How are you today? Good, man. How are you? I am fine. So usually when uh, we hear about politics and crowdsourcing, usually that involves a politician who's trying to get votes and trying to get people involved in donating money. But yeah. in this case, you were involved in a very interesting project where you use crowdsourcing to beautify the city of Akron with art. Absolutely. And that's called Hashtag Love Walls. Can you tell me how that all came about and what's happened since the wall went up? Yeah, absolutely. So I'm the president of a YP board called the Downtown Akron Partnership Emerging Leaders. So we're kind of like the YP arm of the Downtown Akron Partnership. So we do all the stuff that, that DAP does um, just on a, a smaller scale, and we gear it towards uh, young professionals. So the Love the Wall project was um, a project of one of our committees. It's called the My Akron Committee. And uh, essentially the purpose of the committee is just to try to find ways or create opportunities for everyday people to take part in making one transformational change downtown each year. So this can be through events, it can be through art, it can be through anything, really the sky's the limit, anything you can imagine, as long as we can figure out a way to fund it, um, you know, we can do it. And uh, of course, not every project is going to be uh, that expensive, but for our first project, we wanted to do something that was really transformative, high impact. Um, you know, so when we were looking at, uh, we were looking around the city for stuff we wanted to do, we eventually settled on a mural and then it, we were trying to find a place to, to put it. But um, the spot that we chose is on South Broadway. It's a retaining wall that was in a pretty ugly state when we got to it. Um, it's just south of the depot, just north of the metro station. And we found a traffic, there's been a traffic study there that said over 10,000 cars pass that wall every day. So it is the main southern arterial route into Akron. And it's really the first impression that, um, you know, the people riding in those 10,000 vehicles every day get of the city every, uh, every day when they, when they arrive. So we wanted to uh, kind of brighten it up. And, you know, I really think that um, public art is kind of a way for, for a, a community or a city to wear its passion on its sleeve to kind of show, um, show the people who are visiting or living there, um, you know, everything that the, that the city cares about and, and um, you know, that the people are passionate about. So, we uh, we decided that we decided on this project, and then we had tried had to had to figure out a way to uh, uh, fund it. And I think the crowdfunding model really works. I, I um, it was really a way for us to engage as many people as possible um, with a way to leave their own mark on the city. So it kind of establishes an emotional connection on top of um, you know widening the scope uh, so that we could actually do one of these giant transformational projects. So the Kickstarter campaign raised over fourteen thousand dollars, which is a lot of money. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. For, yeah, yes. Yeah, usually people kind of, you know, if they if they're just starting out, they raise maybe a couple hundred dollars at the most. But you guys, right, really right. Well. And you know, at the time, I think that there was it was obviously a risk to take on a project of that scope. Um, when we looked at it, we uh, the budget didn't start off that that big. But then, as the you know, I think anybody who engages in, in any kind of art project will tell you. You know, whether it's music or whether it's you know, painting something, um, you know, where you start off thinking you're going to go and where you end up are usually two different things, and that's a positive thing. But in this case, you know, for us, um, it did increase the the budget quite a bit. Um, but, no, I mean, I think, you know, we, we, we had done some very small-scale projects, things probably within the three to $500 range. This one we just um, – we felt really strongly about how important this was to, to make it happen. Um, we didn't have any prior experience crowdfunding. Um, so it was a risk and it, you know, we, I'm glad we took it, but you know, as far as how we, how we went about doing it, um, you know, I was listening to an earlier podcast you did with uh, Brent Wesley, who is a, a big time local hero of mine. 
Um, right. And I think he was saying the same thing that, you know, um, you got to, you just got to be persistent and, and you got to make sure the message gets out there. So we were pretty fortunate that the project um, started to garner some media attention. So we had the support of some newspapers and um, we got covered on some prime time, like, uh, like local news uh, stations on TV and stuff like that. So we were really fortunate in that way. But other than that, you know, we just, we were on WAKR um, a couple times talking about it, just trying to get the message out. So we were pretty fortunate that those avenues opened up to us once people started to hear about, about the project and got excited about it. And I think that's really what, what ultimately pushed it over the edge. I mean, it was kind of, it, it took all hands on deck for, for the duration of the, the fundraising uh, term, which was probably about three weeks. Right. Um, you, you said a quote, um, you said, uh, great cities connect the dots between their assets. That phrase is true for when, when you're looking at people in a community, when you're looking at, um, you know, any kind of community assets. So, uh, um, buildings, um, the way roads are, are drawn and the way kind of laid down, um, the way different organizations are, are interacting with each other on a regular basis. Um, and I think that, you know, while I, I mean, Akron to me is the greatest city in the world. I, I'm going to live here all my life and I'm going to die here. I love this place. But, you know, I think that we really can do a lot more in terms of trying to connect the dots between our assets. And I think that, you know, this, uh, to go back to the art project one more time, I mean, that this is really uh, another way to do that. This is, it was one more way to get people out um, seeing a, a spot in a city that they may have never taken a second glance at in a different light. Um, to, to kind of establish that emotional connection, leave their fingerprint there, make a difference, um, and and kind of wake up to the fact that, you know, we don't need to go down to, um, you know, somebody who's got a, a ton of money and beg, you know, just to, to have something like this done for us. I mean, you can, uh, I think it's amazing, our generation especially is waking up to the fact that it's amazing what you can do when you have a great idea and the willpower to make it happen. Uh, you know, just you and a couple friends, you know, meeting in your living room after after work, um, and so I really think I really think that's what this is about. So that that phrase um, it means a lot to me. I try to think about it in everything that I'm doing. So, um, you know, I, you mentioned I'm I'm I work in politics. I try to think about it there. I work with the Johnson Act Partnership doing community development kind of stuff, and I I try to use it there. Um, I I think that when you when you start looking at at uh, these different assets in the community or resources in the community um, in terms of uh, their value and how they work together. Um, you know, look, think about them as islands. If, if you don't have bridges connecting all these different islands or some way to get people or, or resources or whatever from one island to the next or information even, um, you're kind of just out there on, on your own. And um, the, the, the productivity and the value of all of these places increases when, when, we all are kind of connected and work together and, and kind of adopt a common vision. Um, so, you know, you can talk about this in terms of government, in terms of art, in terms of, you know, um, just any, any, any kind of community endeavor. Uh, going back to the arts for a second. So now you're involved in social justice and you care about the community and you're really active in it. But before mm -hmm. that, you were actually uh, an artist. You were a, a musician. You, you piled albums. Yeah, so absolutely. So back, yeah, absolutely. So back in 2010, I'm going to read you a quote that you once said uh, back then. Uh -huh. He said, oh, no. getting the, getting, no, it's, it's a good one. He said, getting the right <laughs> advice at the right time can make or break a successful career. Now, at that point, you say it was mostly for artists, but I think that was actually a good quote. Like, you know, getting True. the right advice at the right time can make or break your career. Right. No, I totally agree. I, 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 I still agree with it. I mean, um, you know, of course, advice is only as valuable as, um, you know, the person who's, who's listening to it and, you know, whether or not they're going to they're gonna actually – take it to heart or, or, and not all advice is good, obviously, but, you know, I think, um, you know, I've, I've been fortunate enough to get, um, whether it would, it's, you know, in different arts that I've pursued or, or whether it was in my professional career, um, later on, you know, I've, I've gotten some good advice. In. So in 2012, you released your last album and, and, and mm -hmm. in 2014, you became executive director of the Summit County Democratic Party and, and you've been very in tune to Akron. What was the change that happened? What, what was inside of you that made you decide, you know what, my love for Akron, uh, my love for social justice is burning inside me so much that I'm going to 
put away this musical part of me, which I love, I'm dedicating myself to my community. What, what, what was the change that, that, that made you move that way? Yeah, it's a great question, man. Um, so, you know, I've always been really passionate about the stuff that I'm fighting for. Uh, I I remember growing up, my dad drove us to work every day, or drove us to school every day on his way to work. And he uh, he always had NPR playing. And I remember hearing him responding <laughs> to the stories on the radio and the things that people were saying. A lot of times he was exasperated because, you know, there were so many issues going on that he was, that he just, he hated to see, you know? Um, and, and I think I, it made me curious and it kind of made me hungry to, to understand those things. So fortunately or unfortunately, music takes up a lot of time. So I think that, you know, for a while when I was in high school and then when I was in college, some, uh, you know, it was, it was, it was all I did. And I, I was always still passionate. You know, I volunteered for, for different, uh, initiatives and some, some political, some not. Um, but, you know, I think that probably I fell in love with Akron when I first came to college here uh, in, it would have been 2005. And uh, as I progressed through my pursuit of, of a music career, um, which is which is kind of what I was pursuing at the time, I really kind of learned what it meant to identify with uh, Akronites, what it meant to be an Akronite. And... Um, you know, my grandparents and my parents had tried to instill a lot of passion for the city in me when I was younger. And of course, you know, that's important too, but it, it doesn't, it's not the same as when you, you actually kind of start to, to grow hungry for that yourself. So, um, you know, I, I was, I put out a couple of records. I, I actually took a year off of school for, um, to pursue a record deal. And I got the, I got the chance to tour the country a little bit and, um, you know, a couple of times and, uh, I saw a lot of it. And it really just all made me hungry for uh, for for Akron. And I think, you know, probably you mentioned 2012 was it was the last time I put out a record. Um, I had actually gone to New York for four months to work for an attorney, and that experience was pretty formative for me. I mean, even though I was you know a lot older, I um, I really was just hungry for my home. Um, in a way that I hadn't expected to be. And uh, so, you know, at that time, I was still kind of sorting everything out and trying to figure out what I was going to do when I grew up. You know, I was kind of raised that, that in a way, that, you know, my the way my parents knew, where you you, you go to school, you graduate, you work for a company, um, and you maybe work for a, a couple other companies, and then you retire. And um, I was kind of already feeling myself pulled in the direction of public service and social justice and things like that, community development, economic development. Um, You know, I wanted to be fighting for the greater good. This, this was, um, you know, this is the stuff that really got me excited when I was reading the news and, and, and thinking about things at night. And I had trouble, you know, it's, it's really hard to, it's really hard to write songs, I guess, about, um, about wanting to, to, you know, have a better downtown. Uh, and, uh, so anyways, I, I started looking for ways to, uh, to get involved. And at the same time I met my wife, um, who I'd known for a couple of years, but I really started to get to know her. Then we, we started dating and, uh, that, that happened at the end of 2012 and she was completely oriented in public service already. So she knew that's what she was going to be doing when she graduated from law school. And, uh, it was really empowering for me to, to, identify with her perspective. So that's where I, uh, that's where I ended up and I haven't looked back since. And I'm so glad that, uh, that I have the opportunity every day to get up and, and really feel like I'm, I'm fighting to make the city a better place. Yeah. Speaking of, of making the city a better place, one of the things uh, you said, which I totally agree with, I've been saying this for years, is that how businesses should care more about students and create mentorships and internships for them. Because cause I used to substitute teach, and I would be when um, I was at Goodyear. And I used to think like, yeah. wait, shouldn't Goodyear Middle School be somehow be connected to Goodyear the company? Like <laughs> you're right across Absolutely. the street. <laughs> like it should be some type of connection between the, between the businesses and the students. Right. You know, and no one was talking about this when I was in high school about you know get. I didn't know anybody who who was talking about getting an internship while they were still in high school. Um, but I think that really it's it's as we progress into the 21st century, we're going to realize that that is uh, a fundamental uh, or critical 
component to uh, to a 21st century education um, that we get, especially, I should say, especially as we are dealing with now um, an abundance of testing, an overabundance of testing that, um, you know, kind of forces teachers to teach uh, to a test and it forces students to study for a test. And a lot of times they feel these tests, uh, maybe rightly so, maybe sometimes it's only perceived, but um, a lot of times, you know, these tests aren't really relevant to what they feel they're going to be doing when, when they graduate. And I think that when you, when you're, um, when you don't feel what you're learning is, is relevant to what you're going to be doing, it's really hard to get enthusiastic. Uh, and it's really hard to get engaged with it. And at the same time for teachers, when it's really hard, uh, you know, when it's really hard not, to, well, it's really hard, I should say, it's really hard to teach uh, when you don't feel that you're, what you're teaching your kids is relevant to what they're going to be doing. You're just trying to teach them to a test as well. So, um, you know, yeah, I think, I think it's going to be, a, I think it's a critical component to, to uh, a 21st century, 21st century education. I think that people are really going to um, benefit by getting out in the community, getting project and action-based learning opportunities, um, you know, that are actually going to be relevant to something that they're going to do uh, when they graduate. And, you know, even if it's, even if they have a, a, an experience and it's a bad experience, you know, trying something that they end up not liking, I still think it's a valuable experience because that's, that narrows the, the, their direction somewhat in, in terms of, you know, what they, what they're going to see themselves doing in the long run. And, and you, right now, if you're just trying to take multiple choice tests for, for four years in, in high school and then, uh, that's the only experience you have leading into adulthood is, uh, you know, I don't think you're get, I don't think you're even getting that. So um, I really do think that this is a, a, a critical component to, you know, what we should be doing. That's why it's, it's a, it's really a critical uh, uh, component to, to my message when I'm not campaigning now. Um, I really think we need to be getting people out into the community, um, engaged doing things that, that, could end up being relevant to what they're doing when they graduate. And I will also say we, we were talking about establishing emotional connections and, and uh, that was one of the main philosophies behind, behind the, the love the wall project is that we want to get students engaged. We want to get young people engaged as early as possible with the city, establishing emotional connections, because those are the kind of things that built up over time are going to lead somebody to want to stay and, uh, and invest in their community. Um, you know, I think that when you ask when you ask somebody my age what it was like to graduate from high school or college around here, they're going to say uh, that most of their friends fled because it didn't feel like uh, they'll say things like that there's not a lot going on here or I'm bored or and that's nonsense because we, we there's so much going on here and we really are living in one of the greatest cities in the world. Um, but you know, we have to show people that we have to create those opportunities in order for people to to even see. Akron as a as a possibility. So by by getting people out of these internships, we're not only building skills, resume, um, you know, building confidence, getting them in touch with people who may have the potential to be mentors and friends going forward, but we're also building emotional connections out in the community. It, 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 just a kind of a just a at the core of the whole of the whole program, and I think that over time those are really what going to, uh, they're what's going to make people say. Yeah, it's funny because I, I think a lot of times that uh, Akron Public Schools get a bad rap because there's a lot of good kids in these schools. The problem is they need help. Like they, right. they need help from the community. They need help from, from parents, from adults. They need help from the, from the business around town. I, mm-hmm. I, I do think the talent is there, but I think some, sometimes people just kind of overlook them. I totally agree. Um, first of all, I think we're always looking for somebody to blame here. So a lot of times when we talk about public education, we blame teachers. And I think they have um, they have the hardest job in the world. They're not paid a lot to do it. Um, and we really, uh, you know, they're the unsung heroes of this whole thing because they're really at, uh, at the crux of making sure we have, um, you know, we have a, a, a creative, intelligent uh, critical thinking society going forward. And I think it's also important to recognize that a lot of times we look at the city as the one that has the job of community development, economic development, you know, uh, building neighborhoods up, doing art projects, things like that. And then we look at the school as something completely separate, you know, 
we say, well, they're the ones that they're, they're just supposed to teach and they do kind of what the state tells them to and what the federal government tells them to. And, and we look at it separate. And I think really uh, the two, the job of the two goes hand in hand. I think if you don't get the public school system right, you don't get anything right because you don't have anything else to build anything on. So it's incredibly important to have some passion for this stuff, be hungry for these opportunities for young people and to recognize that, you know, there are, there are big challenges and, you know, I, I think that we don't have all the answers uh, in terms of the best way to go about this. And certainly, um, you know, for the casual observer, the person reading the news or listening to the news at night, um, the, the issue of public education has become severely over-politicized uh, to the point where it's hard to know what's true. But, you know, absolutely. You know, we have, I think we have a great school system with a lot of potential. Um, and we have an amazing community that is the backdrop for um, for what could be, you know, kind of a, a revolution in, in terms of, um, you know, how we think about connecting students to the community through uh, various opportunities, getting internship opportunities, doing art projects. You know, even if I were to say, you know, imagine what it would be like as somebody, for, you know, who who once played in a high school band. Imagine what it would be like to, to have a chance before you graduated to perform at a, at a venue like Lot 3 or the Akron Civic Theater, uh, you know, public venues, but but still a little bit different and a little bit more engaging and, you know, a little bit more passion-inducing uh, than um, than just kind of playing in a, in a high school gymnasium. I mean, uh, we can do that here. It's it's It, to me, is, is probably one of the easier easier challenges we have to meet. You know, going back to um, New York, you, you said you, um, in 2012, you went to New York. Um, mm -hmm. The Akron brought you back. It kind of reminded me about LeBron when he came back from Miami to, to Akron. And sometimes people, mm -hmm. I remember when LeBron came back, he was like, well, why, why would he come back here? But for people who've never been to Akron, how would you, you know, when people, with different political people or, or, or yeah. people come from out of town, how do you describe Akron to people who's never, who's never been here? We are uh, a city on the brink of, you know, an explosion of art and creativity and passion and uh, entrepreneurial drive. We are right on the cusp of reaching our, our own uh, fullest potential. I think that, you know, if you look at the kinds of opportunities that we have here, I live with my wife right downtown, so... Um, she walks to work every day, five minutes to work every day. We have a, an urban, we live a completely urban lifestyle at home. We don't have to drive anywhere. To We can walk to a ballpark. We can walk to all the restaurants and bars you'd ever want to go to. Plenty of music venues. I've got a jazz club in my basement. I uh, I have an art museum out my window. Uh, we li live right next to a, a world-class public library. Um, so all of those things are right here within just a couple blocks. And at the same time, if we drive 10 minutes outside of town, we're in a beautiful national park. Uh, you know, we have, there's just so much to offer here. Um, the music scene is awesome. The art scene is awesome. The drama scene is awesome. Uh, you know, even politics, I mean, it's, it's, politics is something that's usually pretty hard to break into. And I would say, you know, all of Akron's little scenes, whether you're talking about the, you know, the music scene or the political scene or whatever, this is still a small town, even though you can kind of get all of these big city uh, experiences here. So it's still one of the best parts about Akron is that you can make a big impact if you're passionate about something and if you have the willpower to get it done. Um, I think that's evident in the Love the Wall project, especially where, you know, just a couple young people got together and decided that, you know, we wanted to make a difference. And we told our story to the community and, and we made it happen. And I know that in some, in some cities, uh, it's probably pretty difficult to get something like that accomplished. In Akron, it's it's been amazing to me how easy it is to do good things and to do great things. So I tell everybody wh wherever I go that I'm from Akron and I love it. I'm never going to leave it. And you know, that, I think that's why. All right, Nick, thank you for the conversation. If people want to learn more about you or uh, the My Akron Initiative or uh, the Summit County Democratic Party, where can it go? All right, so about me, you can go to PeteNish.com. It's N-I-S-C-H-T, PeteNish.com. For the Summit County Democratic Party, you can go to SummitDems.org. And for the Downtown Akron Partnership and all the stuff that we're doing there uh, in the city of Akron, you can go to DowntownAkron.org.
right. And one last question. It's an off-the-wall question. So what was the scarier moment for you doing your first open mic in 2005 or proposing to your wife? Definitely doing my first open mic in 2005. <laughs> I played at this little place. I'll never forget this, man. I had nobody who wanted to come hear me. Uh, and I had a friend who was uh, uh, kind of just felt bad for me, I think. So uh, I had been practicing some songs in my bedroom, and it was like my dream. I was finally going out to play on my own. I went to this little coffee shop in Lakewood called the Phoenix Coffee House. I don't know if it's still there, but I, it was the kind of place that you feel like it probably still is there because um, it was pretty popular back in the day. It was pretty hip, a little bit too hip for me. Um, oh, my gosh, I was shaking like crazy. I couldn't remember any of my lyrics, um, but I got through it. Um, proposing to my wife, probably one of the easiest decisions I've ever ever had to make in my whole life. Um, you know, that was a no-brainer. That was the best decision I ever made in my life as well. Um, that doesn't mean I still didn't have some nerves, though, going into it. So, you know, because I've never been married. So what did your wife give you that just kind of almost like solidifies you as a person? Yeah, you know, um, I guess a lot of this stuff is really hard to explain. Um, so you might have to take my word for it. But, you know, I think that I know what, what Ellen gives to me is uh, she gave me a direction where I think I was still trying to sort it out for myself. Um, so I met her and everything kind of made sense. Uh, she gave me a purpose. Um, she empowers me to, to do all the things that I'm doing. Um, she's kind of right there by my side cheering me on. She's my biggest fan and my best friend. And, uh, you know, I, I, I really have to say she, she's so amazing in, in her own right. I mean, she's the smartest person I've ever met. She's the most beautiful person I've ever met. So she's more creative than I am. Um, you know, she's, uh, she's brilliant. And, and so, you know, on top of all this stuff that I think she's given me, um, she's also been somebody that I want to be more like. So, um, you know, when I'm measuring myself against her example, um, I've got a pretty good reason to try harder every day and, uh, to do good things and, and to be a better person, to be a better husband, a better friend, better, uh, community advocate, um, so, you know, I, it's it's hard to explain, but, but I met her and uh, everything kind of fell into place and started making sense. And oh, um, Jonathan, you want, you want to make me want to get married. I want to get married. <laughs> I marriage, want to is awesome. marriage is awesome. Um, you know, you got to get through playing the wedding. That's the stressful part. But after yeah. that, smooth sailing, man. It's great. It's really right. good. <laughs> Sounds good. All right. Thanks a lot, Pete. Yeah, thanks. Thanks so much. I want to thank Pete Nish from DAP Emerging Leaders and the Summit County Democratic Party for being a great guest on The Digital Life. Make sure you follow him on Twitter and Facebook at Pete Nish. That's P-E-T-N-I-S-C-H-T. Also, be sure to go to Kickstarter and see how they did the Love the Wall project. Before I go, I have a Twitter question for you. Tweet me at Kevin Lockett and tell me about a crowdsourcing project in your community. Use the hashtag Digital Kev. That's the hashtag Digital Kev. And tell me about a crowdsourcing project that impacted your community. All right, everybody. It's the Digital Life. I'm Kevin Lockett, and I'm out. The Digital Life with Kevin Lockett. 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 Lockett.